easy is it to escalate a dispute rather than de-escalate that dispute? Hi, I'm Dr. Laverne Talbot. Welcome to Sunday School Made Simple, your online community of Christian education teachers and students of the Word. Thank you for joining us as we continue to explore the Word of God using our Precepts for Living commentary, which is based on the International Uniform Lesson Series. And as we've mentioned before, this is the 50th year anniversary issue. So we are so glad you're joining us. And remember to ring the bell at the bottom of this video to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any new lessons. And teachers and serious students of the word, why not subscribe to preceptsforliving.com and you'll get complete lesson plans, videos, the word made simple, and other resources. When you subscribe, you'll have access to Precepts for Living on your tablet, phone, or laptop. Or some of you might want to have the actual book. I'm old school. <laughs> I'd like to have a hard copy. <laughs> anyway, go to preceptsforliving.com and get those resources today. Each week, we make Sunday School simple with an easy to understand format. The text for you students of the word and teaching tips for those of you who teach. Are you ready? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us wisdom to respond as we should to others. Bless us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we are continuing our quarter focused on the biblical theme of love for one another. We're in Unit 2, which defines what love is. <laughs> Our lesson title is Love Your Enemies, and this analyzes Jesus' teaching to love our enemies. Let's explore the text beginning with our lesson A. By the end of the lesson, we will explore Jesus' teaching about what it means to love our enemies, reflect on times when we felt hatred toward others or we were hated by others, and identify ways to love our enemies. The first set of verses for this lesson is from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 31, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. Ooh, there is one key point from these verses in this lesson. De-escalate. Don't retaliate. <laughs> Let's examine the background, setting, and context of these verses so we can better understand our lesson today. Luke's Sermon on the Plain is equivalent to Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching his disciples, which means learners. So the word disciples means learners. We're all disciples, aren't we? And Matthew wrote to an audience, a Jewish audience, and emphasized the Jewish law, while Luke is writing to a Gentile audience, emphasizing social orders. Luke has a very interesting literary technique. He uses kind of up and down. You'll see that throughout the book of Luke. He likes to turn things up and down, and he stresses how Jesus turns the social order of the day upside down. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, which include the twelve, the women, a larger group of followers, and then there's a large crowd 
also assembled on the mountain. But Jesus has a specific focus, and that is for the disciples. That's his audience of the day, the 12, the women, and the larger disciples, crowd of disciples. In today's lesson, Jesus is laying the foundation of Christianity. Very different from the norm. When others do wrong to us, Jesus wants us to take action by doing good to those who hate us. What an upside down concept. <laughs> Jesus begins this discourse with the words, but. And that separates what he is about to teach from what he said previously. Jesus points to a law in the Torah or law of Moses, which states that a punishment should fit the offense. The law is often quoted as an eye for an eye, but it was not meant to encourage individual revenge. The goal was to limit punishment in civil cases. In other words, someone should only face a death penalty in a lawsuit if the offender had killed a family member. Jesus says this law is not practiced in a way that truly represents the heart of God. We should seek to de-escalate conflicts rather than demand punishment when we've been offended. We show mercy to others when, instead of arguing, we exercise restraint. Jesus builds upon this idea by adding that we should give to those who ask and give more than they ask. These words are astounding and extremely difficult for that audience, as difficult as they are for us today. We've been taught that we should love our neighbors and hate our enemies. And we've been taught that we don't have to do good if everyone else isn't doing good. But Jesus says, do the opposite and no. He's not promoting violence. He's not promoting abuse. Jesus is not condoning theft or persecution. On the contrary, Jesus invites those of us who follow him to trust God for justice rather than seeking revenge by taking matters into our own hand. And very importantly in this passage from Luke, much of the wrong is done to our stuff, <laughs> to things, to possessions. But Jesus values our lives more than our possessions. And he instructs his disciples to do the same, value their life again and again and again, more than anything they own or possess. This priority begins in our thought life, which is demonstrated by our actions. Verse 31 is one of the most widely known Bible verses in our popular culture. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. From the time most of us are children, we hear this as the golden rule, but this rule has a very different meaning in this context. The instruction is to treat people the way Jesus taught us to treat them, regardless of how they respond. In this way, our actions exemplify Jesus, and it's a way of demonstrating godly living. What a testimony of faith, patience, self-control, grace, mercy, and ultimately love. Violence and repayment for violence is the way of the world, and it's destructive. Violence that's overcome with love is the way of the kingdom of God. And this is the principle connected to the Christian civil rights movement that we saw in the early and mid 20th century. They responded to mistreatment with public displays of love and nonviolence. And in doing so showed an entire world an alternate way of responding to injustice that literally inspired the world. Well, the last set of verses is from Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36. 
If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. Oh, we have so much to learn, my goodness. What are the key points in these verses we just read? Jesus explains this difficult commandment and Jesus wants us to be compassionate because God is compassionate. Jesus clarifies the commandment to explain why he is asking his disciples to do something that's so difficult and so unnatural. He's asking them because they're following him. We're following him. And by being his disciples, they and we demonstrate the character of our Heavenly Father. Jesus repeatedly uses the phrase, even sinners, indicating that people who don't know God do good to those who do good to them. That's easy. In other words, anyone can lend money or resources and expect a full return. Anyone can show love for someone and expect it in return. But it takes the power of the Holy Spirit operating in the life of a believer to show kindness to someone who doesn't show kindness to you. Verses 35 and 36 are the capstone of this lesson. God is kind to the wicked and he's kind to the unthankful. God shows love to those who don't love him. And Jesus is compassionate to those even who reject him. If we're followers of Jesus, we must do the same. It's not easy to keep this commandment, but it is exactly what we're called to do. We're called to show God's power, his love is greater than our natural tendency as people to hate those who hate us and love those who love us. By not doing that, we bear witness to the reality. When I say not doing that, not hating those who hate us, we bear witness to the reality of Christ in our lives. And we show that when we're kind to those who are unkind or lend to those who cannot repay, we're being compassionate like our Father. If we want to be witnesses to Jesus Christ in the earth, we can't do what the world does, can we? No. We live in a way that people can see the love of God in a supernatural life. Ours. We're children of God. And so we do supernatural things, even when it comes to loving our enemies. This is the new golden rule. Treat others the way we want to be treated, ah, but in a supernatural way. Well, that's what's important to know. What's important to feel? We should feel remorse for the times we've shown hatred instead of love and compassion to others. We're not called to hate our enemies as the world does. We're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. God loved us while we were still sinners, as it says in Romans 5. Eight. While we were shaking our fists in God's face, the Bible says Jesus loved us still, and Christ 
died for us as we were rebelling against him. Oh my goodness. So God has given us great grace and grace is something we don't deserve. He's extended it to us and we should extend grace to others. We love those who hate us, those who curse us, those who abuse us because grace is doing just that, giving what they don't deserve. Well, that's what's important to feel. What should we do in response to today's lesson? We should be kind to our enemies. It doesn't get any more simple than that. We should love when it's difficult to love and this instruction from Jesus is so upside down, isn't it, for us? Even now, we've been, especially those of us who have been in church or been religious or been in a relationship with God for a long time, still hearing this, it's like, oh my goodness, what a reminder. <laughs> this especially is important in our instant media age because we see and we hear about negative depictions of love and at any moment it includes abuse and allowances of, rebuke, of, of abuse, disrespect, objectification, neglect, violence, and more. It's all right here at our fingertips. <laughs> and these images feed us into the false notion that we don't have to love our enemies. They don't deserve our love. And, but that's not what the Bible is saying. Those who dislike us or have hurt us, we need to be compassionate. This is why Jesus' word in this lesson is so helpful to us. Love is not about the negative things we hear and see. Love as God loves looks like giving and compassion even when we don't receive it in return. Can we be kind and giving to those who may have taken advantage of us in the past? Can we forgive them without letting them harm us again? In other words, we don't have to make ourselves victims, but we must forgive. And can we be compassionate to those who are different than we are, who society calls enemies because of their background, race, class, gender, or ability? If we follow Jesus and treat people the way we want to be treated, the way we know God treats us, then we will practice this difficult instruction in a way that pleases and honors God. We can love our enemies by treating everyone like the beloved people of God they are, rather than treat them as problems to be discarded. We should show love to everyone because that is what our Lord has called us to do. Amen? We need to pray for this, don't we? <laughs> I'm praying for you, you pray for me. Okay. Well, that's our text for today. Now let's talk about how to effectively teach this lesson. Don't forget to pray. Pray that your students will have receptive minds, hearts, and spirits as they learn from God's word today. That you'll have clarity, creativity, wisdom, sensitivity, discernment, and added sense of humor too. <laughs> And with grace as you teach. Oh my goodness, it's all important as we impart God's word, isn't it? And pray that God's word would become revelation and your students would apply it to their lives. Now, notice we begin this section by saying how to effectively teach this lesson. And I say that because talking is not teaching. Teaching means communicating so that the students learn what the context is learn the information. And that has to do with a lot of factors, including organization, including learning styles, including so many factors. So that's why we say we want to teach effectively. Now, hook or open this lesson by asking your students a question. Again, questions 
get our students thinking. They may be distracted once they've come to your class. We don't know what has, hap has happened before. And so you hook your students or you kind of open the lesson by pulling everybody in on the same page and you ask them a question. Today's question is, who is your enemy? And then ask, how should you respond to your enemies? Also, because we want to have different vehicles of learning, we want to have audio, visual, and kinesthetic, do download the InFocus video so that your students can see and hear the story, and that'll also draw them into your lesson. And answer the question at the end of that, which is, what has been the response when you answered someone who injured you with kindness? For children, why not ask them, how do we treat other children who look different than we do? Hmm. And remember, children are not like adults. They don't often see differences the way adults do. Racism, after all, is really learned. So let them talk about what they see in other children and how do they respond. Or maybe you'll come up with a better question. That'll be great. <laughs> And then book or present the scriptures by inviting volunteers to read the scriptures either in portions or all at once, depending on your preference. And we like taking it in chunks because it's easier to discuss. Ask them what stood out to you or resonated with you from the verses. Now, teach you read the in-depth paragraphs which explain or exegete the scriptures. And I love the statement. It's on my page 75 in the actual printed copy, which says, where there is injustice, so justice. The idea of sowing like seeds, so justice. Remember, you might well be the only Bible the person in front of you ever reads. <laughs> what lesson of faith will they receive from you today? Isn't that great? And after you finish discussing that and reading that, transition, transition <laughs> into look or explore the meaning. There are so many questions in this portion, and you can look at the questions from search the scripture, discuss the meaning. One of those great questions from the lesson is this. Why do you think so many people regard Jesus' commandment to love our enemies as unrealistic? How are we as believers empowered by God to love our enemies? Well, I know the answer to that. We're empowered by the precious Holy Spirit who lives in us. Amen? Yes. And now you're ready for took or next steps for application. Invite a volunteer to read Liberating Lesson. And then for application for activation, ask each person to read the paragraph to himself or herself, and then invite your students to write down what the Holy Spirit is saying to them. And it'd be great if you're meeting in person to have paper or journals that they could possibly keep and continue from week to week to week. Okay, you have a great class. God bless you as you teach. And now let's talk mailbag. Welcome to Mailbag, Minister Alan Reynolds. Thank you so much for joining us again remotely. This digital world, you know, it's been so different to do these Sunday School Made Simple lessons like this, but it's working. And so <laughs> thank you for being with us through a very difficult lesson, which has one obvious question. What does this mean? How on earth do we apply this to our lives today? enlighten us? It's the question of this lesson um, because it is so foreign to our natural sensibility to love our enemies. Um, it's just instinct even in, in the ways that we grow up from the time that we're young to try to retaliate when people wrong us, right? Rather than to show them grace and compassion and love. And it's something that we have to learn that Jesus challenges the disciples and is challenging us as disciples to do. 
And so a really good picture of what this looks like, and I always like to try to use pictures from other places in scripture to help us understand Jesus's teachings. Jesus does the same thing himself. He'll say a parable and then he'll explain it to the disciples is the Good Samaritan, which also happens in Luke. And so in that scripture, we get a nice picture of somebody who's supposed to be an enemy, the Samaritan, who's different than the man who's hurt along the side of the road. He's supposed to be a sworn enemy, according to him being a Jewish person and the other person being a Samaritan. And yet the Samaritan is the one who demonstrates how to be a good neighbor, right? That's what the point of that parable is, by showing love by doing good and so the samaritan sees the man on the side of the road and he helps him because he's in need regardless of the fact that they're supposed to be enemies based on what society has taught them so jesus expands that with this teaching in the sermon on the plain and says not only do we want to help the people who are different than us right different background we might uh use this in today's society of saying how are we being helpful to people who don't look like us, right? Whether it's race or class or gender or come from a different country or speak a different language. How are we being loving? How are we showing goodness to them? But also expanding it to how do we do good to those who have taken advantage of us, who have wronged us, who have offended us, right? And it's important to note here that we're not talking about those who have been violent toward us or abused us or anything like that. Jesus defends people who are victims of violence, right? We don't want to put ourselves in situations to be harmed, right? And Jesus wouldn't want us to do that either. But if somebody has offended us, right, because we, we oh, so could not believe they said that about us, or, you know, we, we've seen somebody who disagrees with us, uh, people who are on different sides of the political spectrum, or people who live in different places. How could we dare, you know, help them out? Well, Jesus instructs us to do just that. And it means that when we see them in need, if they're, you know, down on their luck, or if they're, you know, trying to put something together, and we know about it, and we were invited just like other people, we don't show up and then turn our nose up at them, right? We don't uh, see them on the street and look the other way, like the, the priest and the Levite who walk past the man on the side of the road. Instead, we do good even when people have hurt us, offended us, been mean to us, are different than us, right? We love our enemies in the same way that God loves us. And so that word that Luke uses in the New Living Translation is very helpful. Are we compassionate to people who are in need, regardless of what our relationship was with them prior? And, and that's really what we, we need to evaluate in loving our enemies. It's all about being compassionate because God is compassionate, regardless of whether or not people respond the way that we think they should. It's impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. <laughs> it's absolutely impossible. And I, I'm just thinking about our political landscape. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're really divided. And so how can we be compassionate to those who think differently, who vote differently, who are different? Oh, my goodness. We need to get rid of some of the tension in our society to de-escalate because there's so much animosity between people. And the, with those of us who are Christians, if we do this, my goodness gracious, we can change how people speak to one another, how they respond to one another. And it's so important to be gracious. We've lost, I think, in, the, you know, in, in a lot of the media, we've lost the ability to be gracious and to speak graciously to others. And uh, that shouldn't be. <laughs> so, amen, amen. All right, well, Minister Allen, why don't you read our Keep in Mind verse as we close today's lesson. Absolutely. And this comes from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28 in the New Living Translation. And it says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. And again, that's Luke 6, 27 and 28. We may have to memorize that one, yes. <laughs> and uh, are we listening? 
to Jesus. Amen. You have a great week. Be blessed.